Hey now, welcome to the City Off Campus podcast with your two favorite hosts, Sammy Sommerfeld and Jack McFarland. Today we are diving into a lot of stuff. We, we've been gone for a little bit, um, so we're going to be diving into some Chicago Bears talk, some Iowa Hawkeyes talk coming off of this Northwestern win going into Minnesota week and um, the last couple games of the year. Um, and then we're also going to be talking some Blackhawks and sh- some Chicago Bulls basketball, looking at them 10 games in. So, Jack, let's dive into some Northwestern Iowa talk first. I was in Evanston for the game. Now, the thing, the two things that were incredible before we talk about the coaching decisions and stuff in the game was literally the entire student section. I don't know if they showed it on TV when you were watching, but the entire student section was the band. They had about oh, no, they don't care about football. Yeah, definitely. yeah, they they had about a hundred students to start. They were all gone by halftime. I'm not even kidding. They were mm. all gone by halftime. A Northwestern fan actually was chirping one of my friends. He almost got in a fight with a Northwestern fan, but that's a story for another day. Um, which I was like, it, that must be a record, like for someone like to actually almost get in a fight with a Northwestern fan. Because I just feel like usually they're just studying at the library. There's no fights to be had. So I thought that was, you know, a pretty big achievement by my buddy. But um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, too, was it's the only game I've been to, college football-wise, where protesters of the home team stormed the field (laughs) in the middle of the game. Yeah, so when I was watching the game, I was very drunk with a lot of my friends. And I... I don't remember anything past halftime, but morning after I was reading up about how Northwestern had students on the field protesting with signs. And then I read an Iowa fan ran oh, through yeah. it. Yeah. And I like, I couldn't help Go but Hawks. just laugh at the fact that it was a Hawkeye who came in and disrupted it all. Cause he was like, let's just get this show on the fucking road. Like we care about football, obviously Northwestern, that is not like their paramount priority. And you could tell they wanted to get some other narrative put on the field. So be it. But I thought it was so fucking perfectly fitting that a Hawkeye came running through and oh. knocked some of them in the signs down. That was gold. Like yeah. I, I didn't know about it until after the fact, but man, th- that couldn't have like unfolded any better. And the- I want to talk about to the atmosphere at Ryan field. It was literally Kinnick in Chicago. That's the closest way of putting it. We were surrounded by black and gold. You literally forgot you were in Evanston. It was family weekend. So you'd think it'd be pretty packed and stuff. It was black and gold all the way through. And the other thing too, is I have to knock Ryan field. The one compliment I can give Ryan field is the concessions were very cheap, which I was shocked because it's Northwestern in Chicago. Like, Things were like, it was like two, three bucks for shit. Like it was like really, it was really solid for food, but all they had was hot dogs, pretzels, nachos. That's all you had. And when you go to Kinnick, you got the chicken tenders, the you got sausage, you got so much diversity and we're spoiled. I realize we're spoiled at Kinnick because we have so many great stadium delicacies you better Ryan feel it's just nobody goes. So they have to invite, and they didn't even have Vienna beef hot dogs, like the hot dogs, we're not even Vienna beef. I'm like, are we really even in Chicago at this point? Like, are they really Chicago's team if they don't have Vienna beef hot dog in the concessions, you know? But going into the on-field play and coaching decisions, um, everybody in the stadium, at least from our standpoint, I don't know about how it was for you watching the game, but we were stunned when we saw Padilla come in. We were like, what is going – like, you got to keep in mind that we were stalling, stalling, it was 0-0. Zero, zero. But we were just like, wow, the Ferris is actually like made a big decision at the beginning of a game, not when they were they had their arms behind their back and they had to just give up. Like they made the decision that changed the game for Iowa. And um, what somebody told me about the, you know, Padilla came in. But what somebody told me was when they were watching the game that at halftime or whatever, Ferris said that like, P- like Petrus just didn't look confident out there, but then no, he didn't look they, comfortable. Or he didn't look they, comfortable. They pulled him because he was they they thought and they saw from what they like. There was a play at the uh, first quarter. It was a third down. He was trying to throw like an out or a curl to the sideline, and he just he threw it like oh, yeah, three yards short. Yeah, and it was yeah. like, well, 
there's no one in his face. He didn't really step as hard as you'd want into it and get that throw. And it was like, well, something's got to be up. And they just said, hey, we got to pull him. And I mean, hindsight, he probably is hurt because he's not even on the depth chart for this week. No, I think he is hurt. So that's where like a lot of that shock, I think, gets a little diluted now, now that we know that that was more of the reasoning. But even still, everybody and their mother has been asking for this type of move to where it gives Padilla an opportunity. And I think this is a good week for him to get, you know, a real shot to prove that, Hey, he could play quarterback. I mean, Minnesota's got a very good run defense means I was going to have to throw the ball a little, something we've struggled at doing literally all season. So this is a great opportunity for him to show, Hey, like I can, I can take the reins for the rest of the year if need be. And I could see Petrus being the type of guy that hits the transfer portal and goes to UNLV with Tate Martell. Like I, I could see that type shit and I wouldn't, wouldn't care. Well, it was just nice. A lot of Iowa fans in the stands were just yelling how it was great not to have a statue in that quarterback. And it really was because you saw Padilla move out of the pocket, roll out, they had some play action, you know, calls and stuff. It was just like, wow, it just, the offense is more open now. Like there's just more, you know, there's more variables than just Spencer staying in the pocket, holding it, holding it, pump faking it, then holding it and getting sacked or throwing it away. And it, it just was, such a refreshing thing to see. But the thing that I was excited about, about Padilla, which is such a small thing, but to me, I think it's going to be so big going into the rest of the year if he stays in that QB, is he didn't turn the ball over. And that was one thing I was a little worried about with him coming in, with not having a lot of playing experience, was would he turn the ball over, you know, with the pressures moving around a little bit more, you know, the offense might be a little bit more scattered. But he did a good job with ball control. And I think, like, that was one of the reasons why Spencer stayed in for as long as he did was there were so many games that we've played this year where he never turned the ball over, where they're like, he managed the game. He did his job. So to see that Padilla, who's a very different type of quarterback than him can do the same thing, but open up the offense a bit more. I'm just more excited to watch Iowa offense now, rather than just excited to watch the defense get interceptions. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, I'm going to tame some of my reaction. Cause like I rewatched the game and, like I just wanted to see like what had happened. And obviously there was a lot of, I would say anxiety on Padilla's part in the first half when he first, mm-hmm. you know, c- come in. Oh, but yeah. Second half. Yeah. Second half. I mean, they didn't score a point other than a shoot act field goal. So mm-hmm. I was, I was wanting a little more just to get like another touchdown or something. It Me took too. the defense to bail it out in the end, like usual to get the win. It was a lot closer than I would have wanted. And Northwestern is quite frankly pretty ass. Like they're pretty shit. So we needed to win that game. It was good for him to not make any mistakes against a bad team. I think we'll really get to see what he's about this week. Um, I don't think Minnesota will have great of like efficiency at getting any pressure to him, but I should probably stop what I say because our O line is pretty shit. Um, but you know, Which is who a knows? Rarity. Which is a rarity, but actually there was a stat I had of about the O-line and just a little snippet of like what they're about, you know, like mm-hmm. how often do they allow penetration, a run for loss, a run for no gain. Um, and this guy on Twitter, uh, Hawkeye Game Film, he crunched all of the data back from 2013 and he has all the running backs and he has it charted to – runs for a loss, no gain, one to four, five to nine and 10. And you look at Goodson in 2021, 21% of his rushes are going for loss and 13% are going for no gain. Two years ago, 19% of his were going for loss and only 7% were going for no gain. So that's just a stark difference. And you have to also take into account Goodson is that big play type player. Like he will take his chances to, you know, take it a little wider or try to set someone up for a move. That's his thing. But seven more percent of his runs go for no gain. Like that to me is red flag. 10 plus yards. His rush rushes this year, 11% two years ago, 16%. Mm-hmm. Like that's it's gigantic. So I think a lot of people are also starting to wake up to the fact that while we all did want quarterback change, there is still a lot that needs to be done like on the O-line. And I think it was in last week's presser, I was reading through the transcript and Kirk even said like, 
this is one of the more green offensive lines that he's ever mm-hmm. had to deal with. And there's nothing they can do really. Like it's, you have to let yeah. the guys play and this is the hand they've been dealt. It's a shame that maybe Brian thought that they could do something. They couldn't the first, like in the middle three weeks of this season and put a lot on their plate. And quite frankly, maybe it fell. I think Spencer's also to blame for some of that, but I think Padilla is set up to have like a really good opportunity here to go against a good defense, win a truly must win game. Because if I was, is able to beat Minnesota is able to beat Illinois is able to beat Nebraska and Minnesota is able to beat Wisconsin. I was in the big 10 championship game. So that's where like this game becomes even that much bigger for Padilla and the whole team as a whole, because there is no more room for error. Like you had oh, a couple, yeah. no, we got you had a, now. yeah, you had a couple games here and there that you were like, ah, oh, maybe who knows? Like the Penn State game, everyone said it was must win, but they were like, ah, if we lose, it is what it is. Not nah, like there's none, none of that shit now. It's must win football. Every week is do or die at this point, especially for this Iowa team that was top five for a month, you know, yeah. and they want those top five type of games. The only chance they'll have it is if they keep winning and someone ahead of them loses. And I think they're very capable of it. Oh yeah. I think especially. I read they have like a 12% chance of going uh, with 10 wins. So it's possible. This could definitely happen. Also though, too, like you look at the big 10 East and they're all eating each other. Like, mm-hmm. you know, each team's getting a loss here, getting a loss there. I think there could be a chance Ohio state loses to a team at the end of the year in their division where like, I think that if we're playing a two loss Big East team and we beat them or a Big Ten East team and we beat them, I think that's still we have a shot at making oh yeah a big you know a big New Year's Six bowl game. So definitely. So we definitely we have we have the rest of our season ahead of us and and the you other, know it oh. is what it is. No, I was gonna say it is what it is. Like Iowa football will never like be overly satisfied with this. We're just trying to cling on to like the highest of our aspirations and inevitably we'll probably fall short. That's just how Iowa does it to us. So my question for you is that, so this is how I envision at this moment with how things stand, the quarterback situation to play out. I'm curious what you think of this take Padilla plays out the rest of the year. Spencer's hurt, whatever. He just, they said him because it's like, what good is it going to do if he comes back? Despite a lot of the guys still loving Spencer as a teammate and stuff, it doesn't take away from that. But just Padilla can open up the offense a little bit more. You know, fans want just makes more sense. But then next year, Padilla's coming back. But there's more of a quarterback competition, I think, there where it's Padilla and Deuce. And I think Deuce gets the reins. That's my that's my prediction. Because think about it too. Like, look at Kirk's history with quarterbacks. He loves guys he can play two, three, four years. Like, he loves it. Yeah. So, is it Deuce Hogan Maybe. time or Spencer's gone? Like, um, is Padilla a placeholder? Because I, I see it as that. That's what I see I, I don't think I don't think we can sit here and make that, like, decision. I mean, I could sit here and say Alex could, Padilla should be Georgia's quarterback right now because he had an offer, but he never went there. So, like, maybe he's the truth. We, we don't we don't know and yeah. like Deuce, everybody wants him because he's Texas. He's, his, name, his name's Deuce. He's from Texas. Yeah, Texas. He plays quarterback. quarterback dude. Like, Last name Hogan. Like that's that's Americana at its finest. Of course, I'd want him to be our quarterback. But shit, if Padilla does it, I, it's gonna be the most Iowa decision ever. Where they're not gonna change it. Like it's just I, they're gonna roll with what they have. <laughs> And not to hate on Petrus too much because, like, there are things he's done this year where I have really respected it. But it's just – imagine if we had Zach Wilson as our quarterback now. Imagine if we had fucking Nate Stanley as our quarterback, dude. I know, Nate. I mean, that's what I've said too is if we had Nate, it we we would have maybe lost a game, but we wouldn't have lost – it, it's you. You could put a lot of names. You could put Jake Rudock in there. You could put Ricky Stanzi. I, I, I wouldn't take Jake Rudock. You could put a lot of names in there. You know who's? And I said this to one of my buddies today. Alex Padilla grades out to be very similar to like a Jake Rudock in terms of play style. Yeah, yeah he's a little yeah. shorter than Jake, but they're yeah. pretty similar. Yeah, no, they are similar. They are similar. Oh, so you better oh. buckle up and get used to that. 
I know, I know. It'll be interesting. But now moving on to Chicago Bulls real quick. Bulls are having a great start to the year. They're bringing Bulls basketball back, and Joe Keem came back for a game. They honored him. He retired a Bull, which we love to see. Tibbs went, was back with the Knicks. But oh, on quick thing on that, that little Joe Keem moment, they went up and everyone waved at Joe Keem, said hi to him. Mm-hmm. Taj waved, Derek waved, Tibbs Luol. fucking zeroed in on the court, didn't even bother to look oh, at yeah. Joe Keem. They like, I was Taj like, what a savage. Rose. Yeah, they like, came what a savage Tibbs. It was like, just take a, a throwback. Just take a Xanax and look up to Joe and give him like a wave or something. This guy's a psychopath. <laughs> but, Respect to him. But hold on, going back to that Joe Keem night, they played the Knicks that night, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I Rose and want a Knicks Bulls series in the playoffs. That's what I want. Well, I think that's what everybody I, I don't wants. Want that. I do. I, I think don't. that would be. I don't want to be. It's going to be heartbreaking. I don't give a shit. That'll make it even better. That'll make it even better. I think that'll make the series that much more must watch to watch the Bulls. And when was the last time they were must watch? Like, oh, when, it would be an incredible series to watch. When, it would just be heartbreaking. I think the last time the Bulls were ever like must watch, like actually must watch, was Nate Robinson playing against the Nets. It was like, yeah. oh my God, Nate Robinson is the starter. Or, no, oh, you mean the yeah, Nets playoff series? Yeah, okay, when yeah, they're yeah, playing yeah. against them. And I was yeah, like, yeah. Yo, Nate Robinson actually is really good at basketball and can't just dunk it. That was the last time they were no, must the watch. La- no, the last time they were must watch was this Cleveland series, their last year there, when they went back and yeah. forth. Because they, they almost not Cleveland off. Yeah. Uh, and no, it was like, true. and everybody was like, oh, this is the end of the Bulls team. And then it was like, wait, do we still have something here? And then, you know, we lost. Like, because yeah. if we would have knocked off that team, I think they would have ran it back one more year. But, yeah, yeah no, up. and one thing with the Bulls, you know, Patrick Williams getting hurt, you know, I think it was he dislocated his wrist, did whatever. He's out for the year. That fucking but, sucks. Like, you yeah, want your, your young kid to get his second year? The guy the guy I was going to say, though, who I think is a steal, free agency steal, is Alex Caruso. He's yeah, been unreal. Definitely. Like, every Lakers beat writer right now is just talking about how the Lakers completely messed that up because they could have matched him. They would have been deep into the luxury tax. But he's literally the guy that the Lakers are missing right now on their team. Like, plays defense. He's been making some offensive plays. Like, he he's a steal. Four years, $37 million for that. And he's, like, been a key piece in transition for us. He's made some key plays with Lonzo and Levine. Like, I love that. He move. averages nearly two and a half steals a game. That's yeah. a, that's a yeah. menace. And and Lonzo has been everything I hoped Lonzo would be. I think Lonzo's just hitting the beginning, though. I think Lonzo's gonna. I think by February, Lonzo's gonna be a contender for an All Star appearance. That's my prediction. I think Demar makes an All Star team, which I never expected to be honest. I thought he'd score. I thought he'd put up eighteen or whatever. But the way Demar's been playing, I'm like, wow. I'm like, just wow. He's just been so efficient. And I think the way him and Zach roll off each other, it's just like, it's just amazing. It's just fun basketball to watch. Like I haven't enjoyed watching Bulls basketball since the, and it was cringy basketball. Even then the Jimmy Butler D Wade year was the last time I really enjoyed watching Bulls basketball. And it was more just because I finally got to see D Wade in a Bulls uniform after waiting yeah. years and years and years to see that happen after him saying he wanted to be drafted a bull. He was going to come to Chicago in 2010, didn't happen. And then, you know, it finally did. And we went on that one little run against Boston. But um, to now see this Bulls team where it's like, okay, we have a team for a couple of years now. Like, they're young, they're fun, they're high-flying, they're fast. Derek Jones, I love that acquisition too. Just, it's going to be great. Like, I'm, I'm so excited for this Bulls team. I love Billy. I've always loved Billy Donovan since he was at UF. And to see Billy Donovan have a team where it's like they respect him as a coach and he they're playing the style of play that fits Billy Donovan as well is just awesome to see. Because the thing with Billy Donovan I hated too was that when he was in OKC, it was just weird. Him dealing with guys like, you know, KD, Russ, like that wasn't Billy Donovan. He needed a group like this, high-flying, fun, competitive, you know, want chip on their shoulder. This is a Billy Donovan team. I love it. I think that – Eventually, um, I think the Bulls are going to have to make a move for another backup center because I, and now this could just be my little pea brain that doesn't watch a ton of basketball, I don't even like Tony Bradley at all. I don't know. I don't like the way he looks. Yeah. 
And his name's Tony Bradley. So it's like, most like generic... that's just not a name that I can root for. Yeah. He doesn't have a ton to him. Like he's just yeah. – the best way to describe Tony Bradley is he's there. And yeah. I think we need somebody to be like – more than just there, you know, type of deal. Well, the um, guy who I miss is Gafford. Yeah, you know, it'd There's be nice to have a Daniel Gafford. I think he's hurt right now, unfortunately. Yeah. But either way, like, the Bulls, they don't have a ton of holes. I think their bench is a little thin. I think they need a lot of people to, like, take that next step, which they have the players who are young enough to do so. But I don't buy into the Tony Bradley talk i i think vooch is like the most stretch five as a stretch five could get mm-hmm. and they need somebody to like come in and rebound because i think it was when they played uh the sixers a couple nights ago well, and Embiid was i mean Embiid, no, but when well. he was off the court and vooch wasn't on the court i was like all right let's let's go inside out or some shit i don't know what i'm saying but like tony bradley was just there doing nothing well, the like, guy God. who i love us to get with the rebounding is get andre drummond Sure, the guy I'm all for Andre Drummond. He like, got that's... 25 rebounds the other night. Let's just have him rebound the ball. Perfect. That's all we need. Just stand under there and go in transition. Put your hands up yeah, and just exactly. grab the ball, throw it out, and we'll exactly. get moving down the court real quick. Like that's actually phenomenal. I'm all for low contract, easy Bulls to trade a second round pick and um, Devon Dotson for Andre Drummond. 100. percent that's that's the deal that the Bulls will need to get put over the top and be a top four seed. But no, actually, like they there really isn't a whole ton. I think one of the really big surprises though for the Bulls too has been Io Desumu and Io. Oh, yeah. I think he's been playing a lot more than anyone really expected. Um, but I think it would take a ten year old to realize that Io looks like he needs like fifteen more pounds. Like he looks like a yeah, but he's been middle school making plays. Oh, I and, know. And the thing with him, he just looks like a middle schooler on the court at times. And I said going into the NBA draft that if he fell in the second round, he's going to be a guy that's, you know, before he was a bull, that he was going to surprise me. Just with how he played in college was just so good. He was just one of those guys where I'm like, if he gets onto the right team, he's going to be a piece. He can, he's going to be a developmental yeah. piece, but he's going to be a piece. And for him to be in Chicago, hometown kid, it gives me D Rose vibes, not at the level that D Rose was. But to play at Illinois, be a Chicago kid, and now you're hooping and you're on a contending Bulls team, and you just have, you know, you have so much room to develop. Like, you know, it's going to be exciting to see what happens with him. Yeah, I I think he's making the Bulls comfortable with the reality of, hey, we can actually get rid of Kobe White once he comes back healthy yeah. and, and actually maybe That's get what a, says, trade Kobe White. Right. Get like a three to come in that a three, four that fills what Pat did or get that five, like we said, to fill what Tony Bradley literally doesn't do. You have Kobe White, who is more than expendable. Caruso has proven to be a great backup. Io can be a one or two at any moment. Like that's they're in good hands and I'm oh, excited yeah. to see where they go. And I, I think it's hilarious that all of the gambling lines had them at like 43 or 43 and a half wins over under. I'm like, dude, who the fuck would ever taken that under? Like they are blowing that shit out of the water. Even David Kaplan, when he was on the other week said, they're going to blow that shit out of the water. Mm-hmm. They're gonna, they're, I could see them having the ability to be anybody in a seven game series with the team they have now. And like, let's say we turn injuries off like this is a video game they could beat anybody right now like i'm very confident so, in this bulls team not in the style of play but in terms of you know zach levine's an all-star i'm not going to knock him demar's a former all-star big name but it gives me atlanta hawks vibes of when it was horford corver those guys or it was just a group of guys that played like a team it was just fun team basketball Yeah, jeff teague throwing it over yeah. to josh smith and he's like the the weapon and then they could like throw it over. Joe Johnson, ISO threes, Joe, Kyle Lou Will. on that team. Yeah. Like just there's so many different pieces and moving yeah. parts. That's why I see pieces. this team. Being. I like that. So that's been my like comparison where this team could, you know, dominate the East and go on a run and they either fall a little short or they make a finals in a year or two. So I like that. that's a really I think, good comparison. Yeah. And I think with the Nets being down right now and, you know, some of these other Eastern Conference teams, the two teams that I see contending. Or three. I can't knock the Bucks. I'd say it's Bucks, Heat, Bulls. Those are my three Eastern Conference teams. And then Golden State's just looking unreal right now. 
Yeah, Steph had well, 50 last night. <laughs> that's Mixed what you, see where Clay is when he comes back, but dude, that's just, what you get when you play long game with the players and they've bought into yeah. that long game. It's like you got James Wiseman and you flipped D'Angelo Russell for funsies, and now you have a really good team with people coming back. Well, it's not Wiseman. Like, Gary Payton Jr. has been unreal, and he was a G League guy. They just brought him up to be a full NBA guy, like, and he's getting steals all over the place. He's just been playing great. I mean, they just have dudes. And, like, you know, also what's great about them is you have clearly defined leadership and culture where you have Iggy back there this year. You have Steph, you have Clay, and you have Draymond. And then it's like after that, everybody just is like, here's my role. We're bought in. Jordan Poole is one of my favorite players in the league right now. Um, and then if you look at the Lakers, I'm really interested to see these Warrior Laker battles later this year because Carmelo, dude, is Carmelo right now. He is mellow right now. He put up 26 last night. He's been shooting the ball like. They've been fun. Like, they're not playing that great, but I'm interested to see what they're going to do when they need to make a run later on. I'm going to announce the Lakers as dead right now. <laughs> okay. We'll see. We'll see. I but, believe um, in that. Like, we'll g- I'll give them a quick little look I, at. I love seeing Carmelo Hoog. I love it. I hate their I hate their roster. Oh, with me too. My it's entire just, heart. It's a retirement home. <laughs> like, you – so old. Like, oh, my God, Wayne Ellington, LeBron, Rondo, Dwight Howard, Avery Bradley, DeAndre, DeAndre Jordan, Jordan, Mello, yeah. Russ. It, that's too many old people. Trevor Ariza, way yeah. too many. If you're born in well, the that's 80s, the thing. Well, nah, if you're born in the NBA, if you're born in the 80s and you still play on the NBA team, like you should just be a veteran like a uh, Udonis Haslam type dude. They got too many UDs on the team right well, now. Well, here's the thing is. They chose basically Trevor Ariza over Alex Caruso. That's what, what, a, what a bonehead fucking move. What <laughs> a stupid the cheaper move. contract. It was crazy. But Dumb. now talking talking craziness, going to that Chicago Bears game last night on Monday Night Football in Schittsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, dude, I mean, what? One, Justin Fields making quick decisions. We love to see it. We love to see it. I mean, for me, I'm not really going to complain about Fields. He's just developing. I love him more and more as I watch him. I refuse to complain but, about him. Anything he does, I'm okay with. But, dude, like that ref issue, dude, when the ref literally bumped into our guy, like, come on. So come here's, on. He, here was the fucked up thing. That entire – there were three plays in the last – like that entire little sequence where – we had a touchdown, like, called back because the that same ref, Tony Carrenti, threw a flag on James Daniels for yep. an illegal low block when it was outside, in his eyes, outside of the tack or tight end box, I think it was. Here's, here's the problem. James didn't even make contact. So it was like, that's not fucking illegal if you don't hit the guy. Sorry. Uh, next thing. James Peters was trying to reach around on the outside, outside of the tackle box. He got fucking cut. That's not allowed anymore in the NFL for DBs to cut alignment outside of the Mm -hmm. tackle box. So that was another missed call. And then when Marsh, I'm not going to criticize him for doing the triple karate kick after the sack. Like you just got promoted from practice squad. Good for you. Celebrate for a big play. But Like, he stared at the sideline, whatever. Like, he's just trying to, like, fucking do his little shoulder roll flex thing, whatever. I get it. The ref did look like he had his hand on his ref, or on his flag, rather, and he did look like he gave him a little hip check bump, and then he threw the flag and (laughs) taunted right on his ass while he threw the flag. And he was asked after the game by one of the Bear Beat reporters, and he said, like, the, the hip check contact was not what, like, brought the flag about. And it's like, well... As an NFL, like as a league, there needs to be a defined definition of what is and is not taunting. Because like Ryan Clark made a good comment about it ESPN. It's like, dude, if I've been busting my balls for like 20 years to get to this moment, like beating my body's ass, and I will have chronic pain for the rest of my life. And you're telling me without a firm definition what I can and can't celebrate and like how to do like that's horseshit. And it is because that decision of the referee to say, ah, oh, you can't fucking celebrate like that. Truthfully, and not I'm not going to say it cost the Bears the game because we still had a chance at the end, but 
it really hurt our fucking chances. And that's bullshit. Like that can't, that cannot happen. It was egregious to see what happened last night in, in Schittsburg. Like truthfully, it was, uh, I know that referee fucked the Bengals game a couple weeks ago on that bullshit, like head on whatever contact tackle to like stop the runner. That was egregious. But what happened last night, and especially with Fields, like he took a couple licks for your like. Oh if yeah, he was, where, if he was if, fucking Tom Brady. That guy's in jail. Or Big He's ben, already Big getting ben got calls. Guantanamo. Sure, it's like, dude. Well, what the fuck does Justin Fields need to do? Win a Super Bowl in order to get these calls? If that's the case, let's fix the fucking rules because that's not that that doesn't that doesn't maximize the exposure of your star players in the league. Like that that hurts so, your chances of having the best product out there week in and week out. That was I was beside myself with the fucking no calls on fields. Beside myself. So the guy who I'm calling the Bears MVP of the game because I'm shocked that he was actually productive on offense is congratulations Cole Komet. 87 yards in the game. 87 yards out of Cole Komet. We yep. he actually caught the ball six yep. times on eight targets, and he was successful at it. Like we finally have a tight end who is mobile again. Like yep. wow, like he doesn't just stand and block. He actually catches the ball. So now, like I've hate on Cole Komet basically since day one, where I'm like great blocker, but that's all he does. And so now to see that there's hope that he can be an offensive piece. I just hope we keep doing that more and more and he becomes a main target for fields. I think he'll always be a, a pretty, I will not say ma- pretty main, but I think he will be just strictly because like tight ends are very easy for a quarterback to hit just based on like where they run their routes and how they open up pretty quickly. Cause they can't get like 20 yard separation from a DB all of the time. So I think, I think we'll continue to see him get better and better. I think Mooney will always look good with Fields. I think oh, Allen yeah. Robinson is finding reasons for Bears fans to hate him. I tweeted last night he's allergic to running with the ball. I still think he yeah. is. Um, it was nice to see David Montgomery back. He's an absolute psychopath with the ball mm-hmm. in his hand. And I want everybody who's listening right now to eat their own fucking words saying they want to trade him. Shut up. We're not trading this guy. He is our franchise running back. He is exactly what we want. And then some, you pay guys like this. You don't just find David Montgomery's laying around. Like yeah, this guy. I think you're defending him because he went to Iowa State. No, I him. think I think there was three runs last night where he carried four guys for like first. Oh, yeah. No, I, no, like, no, no. Well, I, I like David Montgomery. Well, I don't see Khalil, Khalil Herbert doing that. I think Khalil Herbert is yeah, a great no. cha- I think he's a great change of pace. I think he can find holes. He's got good vision like David, but he's not David. And I don't think any of our running backs are close to what David is. David, yeah, but I think top Khalil, five. I, I do think Khalil is going to be a great complimentary back for us in the next couple of years. I agree. I think he's a guy where, you know, the Bears, one thing that we've always kind of like, you know, we have with Jordan Howard and stuff a little bit, but like – having multiple guys who we can trust with the ball make big plays for us and get that punch when we need it. And I think we have it with Herbert. I think we finally have that, you know, middle of the round back who will be a bear for a while. Yeah. And there, there was another, uh, another stat that came out after our right tackle, Larry Borum, who's come back for the last two weeks. He's gone against TJ Watt, Nick Bosa. He's only allowed, I think, two pressures and one sack, maybe no sacks and two pressures, either or for a fourth rounder out of Mizzou, who people said was a little too big to play tackle to come in after being a little hurt with a conch and prove that one of the two tackles so far that we've drafted have hit. That's a nice feeling. It's also nice to hear that. I don't think we've talked about it on here, but Jason Peters was at the podium while Nagy had COVID, so Nagy did not have much control. And Peters said Jenkins is expected to come back at some point, Tevin Jenkins, that is, which makes me even more excited to the fact that if oh, he yeah. is, like, able to play. He was our guy cleared, in the draft. Let's let him, like, play because Peters, like, he's been getting banged up. He's 39. Like, the guy's legit falling apart. I don't think he's playing football to, like – win games for the bears i've actually come to the conclusion that he's playing to help justin develop i think Mm -hmm. excuse me he sees that full picture that bigger picture of 
I'm not going to like be winning games with the bears, but if I could help this kid not get killed, like I'm going to do that. And I think that'll like maybe make him play a little harder. I'd fucking hope like the guy looks old and humongous yeah, and humongous. I mean, that's Jason Peters. He's never been a small cat, but I, I would when love you're 41 any, yeah. or 39 or whatever he is. I, I would love any type of scenario where we can get Jenkins put in just because, I mean, we've never, we haven't seen it once. And I think if we could see him, I mean, we're not going to make the playoffs. If we could see him for weeks, 15, 16, 17 or whatever, if we, is there a week 18 now? I don't know how the NFL works either way. Yeah. Any of those final three games, if we could see any sort of Tevin Jenkins, I think that's a positive just because, Look, he, that means he's practiced for a little. They're comfortable with putting him in, and we'll see what he's got. And then he can have a full off season to work on whatever the hell he saw in those three games of film because I think getting three games of film is better than getting nine weeks of practice film. I think that's pointless. Nobody's going hard in NFL practices I'm, anymore. Imagine if we would have had 2013 Jason Peters uh, right now. How great that would have been for Justin Fields. Imagine if we had 2013 Jay Cutler on this team. Oh. Be getting smoked like 60 times a be, season again. Dude, we would have been literally undefeated right now. I'm telling you right now. He would have hidden all Matt Nagy's <laughs> faults and mistakes. And I actually we would think be undefeated. I mean, if, we would have killed Green Bay. We would have well, killed I, I also I also think if Jay Cutler Jay, was our quarterback Jay would have right now. Rogers, though, and would have been like, I respect it. He's like, well, I respect I, the immunization. I think he would be. I think he would be okay with going to the media and absolutely tearing Nagy apart, especially with how it takes too long to get nah, the plays in. Oh, I think, no, I no, think he, he would at a point. Jay no. literally has said, Jay has literally said he do it. that he would never call out a coach or anything. Cause that's just not what he, he, he didn't like to give into the media stuff. It just wasn't what he did. He'd do it. No, I, he I don't think, I think 2021 I, Jay would do it. Not if 2013, you, Jay. If, you, if Jay was still around and he had lived through those Trespin years and you had Trespin 2.0 and Matt Nagy again, I don't think he'd you're let saying like if he just twice. played. You're saying like if it's like old Jay. You're not saying young Jay. You're saying Oh, like, Jay is fucking Jay. I think Jay will get fed up and let you know regardless. I think he'll say it. I, I just would have. I think, I I think there'd imagine, be a mutiny on their hands. Imagine if Jay would have played during COVID. It would have been the immunized division. Don't even try to fucking say the word that nobody really understands what it means right now because it's the biggest hot topic word of Aaron Rodgers' career right now. I know. But it's amazing. Dude, what a fucking shit show that was. And God bless it for happening because Jordan loved looking. <laughs> Yeah, I know. But I know. I'm but also now gonna... what's scary is now they might be like, okay, Aaron, we'll give you the bank. Nah, I don't think he gives a fuck. I think it's so past money where he's I, so I still out of there. I think he goes to Shittsburg. That's been my yeah, case. So I, I think, think so too, to man. I think so too. But, I mean, look, hold on. We're just going to – let's go – for our listeners, let's go through the Bears' remaining schedule. They're at the halfway point of the season. They have a bye week next week. So I hate the 17-game schedule, dude. It's just well, like, I know, but, but I, like so our, I, I like where our bye wins. week is because it's oh, yeah. nice nice and middle. Um, we're 3-6 and six right now, so make sure you guys are counting in your head. We play the Ravens, which I'll count as a loss. Mm-hmm. Uh Detroit, which I'll count as a win. win. We we like fucking need to win that on Thanksgiving because oh, if yeah. we don't win a game on national TV this year, I'll fucking cry. I'm not going to uh, eat Thanksgiving dinner if no lose. Thanksgiving will be ruined. Cardinals. I'm eating steak on Thanksgiving. I don't even know how to reply to that. That's <laughs> sacrilegious. We that's lo- not- I'm saying if we lose, okay, I can't Fair enjoy enough. the holiday. I'll eat a ham on Thanksgiving if we lose. Uh, I think, honestly, the Cardinals at home in the cold could we be an intriguing – that's an intriguing I'm game. I'm saying we lose that. We'll see. I like this Cardinals team despite all the injuries they've had. If like Justin them. Fields keeps progressing, you never know. Packers, we lose. Minnesota will beat because they're just a bad team. They can't score yeah, points. Yeah. They're actually, like, falling off the cliff yeah. right now. <laughs> Zimmer. Mike Zimmer needs to – Get out of there. Actually, I think they just need to blow the whole team up, figure oh, it out. They Bring totally Nate Stanley have in. to blow it up. Yeah. Seattle. At, is that? No, it's at Seattle. That's a loss. Day after Christmas. Ruined my Christmas. Day after New Year's, the Giants at home. We win that. I mean, you'd hope. 
we've lost that game in like recent yeah, but years. I'm taking the win this year, especially with nobody <laughs> believes Saquon's a premier back right now. So it's y- like you hope you hope we win that game, and then Minnesota win. last game of the year. You hope we win that game. Yeah. So what's because that put us up? I don't know. I lost count. But for the people at home, I I mean, I'm looking at I think Detroit, we're win seven Minnesota. Games. Hey, and I've said six. That was my win total for before this year. I remember it. I've said six, and I'm standing by that six or seven. It, it's not great, but it's good enough to get Nagy out of here. So I yeah, think yeah. think we're looking at a bright future with a very depressing present. But that's okay. I, I think I think Mitch should retire and he should become our next OC. <laughs> I think. No, I don't want to say it out loud, but actually, I will. I think if the McCaskies want to get really, really, really bold and they want to piss off a lot of Bear fans, they should go give Kellen Moore a trillion dollars to come be that. Oh, coach. no. You know what I thought you were going to say? Is if they really want to piss off Bears fans, they sell the team to the Ricketts. Fuck. So, yeah. No, no, no. So, so. <laughs> What do you what do you think their their messaging would be going into the offseason? Oh, we're going to be really aggressive with our free agency signings and, and trying to make Justin the team Fields better. And they for third round picks because they, they tra- can't afford to pay his future salary in four they, years. He, yeah, they <laughs> trade Justin Fields for for Gardner Minshew and Ryan Fitzpatrick. <laughs> <laughs> That's just who they roll with. <laughs> uh, that would be so Ricketts. Oh, and then they they trade so Roquan ridiculous. for like a bundle of picks. They're like, we'll f- we'll find a oh, bunch yeah, of Roquans. Oh yeah, they two punters, and they draft they draft the kicker that they claim is the next Robbie Gold, and they're like, this is gonna bring Bears football back. Oh, and la- last thing you actually did bring something to my mind that I forgot to bring up. We do need a new punter. Like yeah. Pat's Pat's leg is is getting old. Getting he hits shot. forty two yards. Yep, let's call the next. Let's call the time. next Miami punter. Yeah, I'm down. I mean, the only thing I'm requiring for us to draft our next punter, I've said it multiple times on here, Pat O'Donnell, bench pressed more reps than Jadavion Clowney at the combine. Oh. My punter has to bench more than a different skill position. I think Facts. that is ha- very intimidating. It's a must. I think, and I think if the In punter squat. Could, right, if the punter could weigh more than two twenty five, that's also a plus. Facts. But, those are the only nice. things I have for my my next punter. I like it. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm battling a lot of congestion right now. Uh-oh. All right, no, oh, I know it's it's not my flu game; it's my seasonal illness game. So, <laughs> the weather's changing, my clock changed, and now my immune system is freaking out and doesn't know how to react, and I have congestion switching from my right to left nostril and back, and it's like I can't keep up. Uh-oh, uh-oh. I don't know, I can't keep up. Story right song. Yeah. Well, on to the Blackhawks, where we have a lot of great news. Uh, we won a game. We won a game, or two. We've won two now, actually, yeah, last night. we won recently. Last night, we won after they fired Jeremy Carlton and named Derek King, the new interim coach, Kinger. He looks like a mixture of... Vin Diesel and Walter White. Yep. He look and he's Great got the per, he's got the personality of like a 1980s junior B hockey coach who just wants the kids to play hard and I, score goals and I love it. Like he I looks like a guy, guy. I said to my friends, I said he looks like a guy who could eat a lot of Al's Italian beefs. Yeah. Oh, he definitely. Can pound some beefs. Yeah, he, yeah, and he likes the hot peppers, and he likes oh, his fries yeah. nice and wet and oh, filled with yeah. grease and shit. So, look, they're two nine and two right now. This like the season's over. It's yeah. just a matter of like saving face, and they have saved a lot of face. Like everybody who we've all bitched about for the last five years is gone. Yep. The only problem is we got like a year or two left with Taze and Kane, and yep. we have a and roster. Right, and we have a we have a roster that Stan convinced the ownership in the world that would be competitive, yep. and we gave him that off season to make these moves. Where now we don't have a first round pick. Now we have a goalie who's going to leave us after this year. Yep. Now we don't we'll have a general manager. Now we don't have a head coach, and it's like, well, everything stands so, like sold ownership before that 
lawsuit came to light and they let him continue through his summer off season, typical workings, he fucked us a little more and he's left like nothing for the Blackhawks to work with right now. Like absolutely nothing. So guys like Strom, Kubelik, Dahan, um, those guys I think are all going to get traded sometime this yeah. year. Um, Kurdishev maybe like there's, there's just a lot of names that I think are just not going to be here anymore. And that's like, I'm cool with it because that's like what they have to do. Mm-hmm. But I, I think the Blackhawks are going to be like a much better team going forward. Like actually like, Oh, this me too. S- no, I, it's gonna sound I, I think we're going to, I think we're going to have fight in us. I think the, the games are going to be competitive. Games. They're going to go above 500 win. for the rest of the season. Oh, I think that they're actually going to, because they don't like have some 33 year old fucking yeah. unqualified Swedish B league coach running the third most valuable NHL team in the fucking world. <laughs> it's like, what do we, what do you, and that's like actually something question, like take, question. Does Carlton go to the Florida Panthers? No, Carlton's gonna go coach <laughs> for fucking like Notre Dame in college. Like he's or gonna like go go coach in Russia. Sure, but go back to fucking Swedish B League where you came from, Jeremy. Like we didn't. Did you ever hear the story of how Jeremy became a coach? No. He was playing hockey in the Swedish league. He couldn't hang around the AHL and the NHL. He had like health problems, conks, and all of that. So he made his way to Sweden. And he was on this B, this B League team, and I think the coach might have gotten fired or something, but they promoted him to be the Jackie Moon players coach. And he took them from the Swedish B League to the Swedish A League, and then the next year they, like, dropped the ball, but Stan didn't give a fuck. Stan hired him right away and said, we're going to hire you, we're going to fire Joel, and you're going to take us to the promised land. And he had, like, I mean – Granted, he coached one year in Rockford to like get his feet wet. Feet were barely wet. And then he threw him to the NHL where it's been I mean, he made the playoffs a couple times. They fucking stink. Like they're just yeah. not a good team. So yeah. I we, I, we can only playoffs. go up at this point because you had somebody who like does not know how to coach in the NHL coaching there. And look, I I was a big Jeremy guy. I thought Jeremy could figure it out. I thought a lot of people bagged on him way too quickly. But I think we've seen in the last 80 games, like including this year and what we saw last year, there's just like no growth. And you yeah. would want to see like some sort. And there was just fucking nothing. So, hey, I think they'll be above 500, not record wise, but like from here on out to the next 70 games, they'll go, they'll win more than they'll lose. And that's, I think that's all you could ask for at this point, yeah, especially for a team that doesn't have a first. It goes with my take that there can't be two good teams in the United Center at the same time. But you know what, Sam? You know whose teams are doing really well in Chicago right now? The Ryan Stores. They're doing really well. One team is. One team's competing for a championship. The other one, they're at home right now. When was the last time the Bulls made the playoffs? Uh, 2017. Mm. Okay, pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, they're going to make it again. And the White Sox have made it for two years in a row. So that's cool. It's pretty easy to say that those two teams are top dogs right now in their respect. I mean, the Bears made the playoffs last year. So, I mean, did they? Yeah. I mean, I didn't even really count it. It was kind of like a shoe in COVID thing. Like they felt bad. Yeah. Well, I mean, the the McCaskies are in the mix. So. Can't just say um, it's the Ryan's works. Just saying. And I hate to kind of bring it full circle for you, but I'm in the party of hoping Pat Ryan buys the Bears. Oof. See, so. <laughs> I'm not against it. I mean, he owns. He has yeah, he's, partial a, ownership he's a minority. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's not. I mean, let's so see I, if he's I, alive to buy the Bears. <laughs> hey, fuck. He's making Ryan Field look pretty cool. Yeah, He's I know. He's giving him more oh, additions dude, it was, shit. It felt like we were at a high school. I really wanted it to be cool, but it just was so... I mean, that's the depressing thing. You also just got to realize, like, it's, it's fucking Northwestern, man. Yeah, dude. Dude, they only... I, they, I, I actually don't... They drank mimosas at 2 p.m. on Saturday. That's what they were doing. Everybody was <laughs> drinking mimosas. I'm not even joking. We were the only ones not drinking mimosas. <laughs> so, it was there were literally a hundred mimosas getting poured at a time. They were all drinking mimosas. That's what so, they do in Northwestern. 
So I tweeted Saturday morning from the bar Sulk and I tweeted bad news for Northwestern. We woke up and everybody was bag on me like, oh, we're, we're not shit, blah, blah, blah. But then I was like, extra bad news for Northwestern. We're drunk and they're still doing yeah. homework. Oh, like, they're dude, such yeah. fucking dude, losers. Dude, we were yelling. <laughs> we were yelling. The nerds are all at the library right now. And then you- we were at the SIG, we were at um, a SIG high tailgate and um in northwestern and literally guys and girls were coming up to me and my friends with us in our hawkeye gear saying we know you guys won already we couldn't even talk trash because they literally said we know you guys are gonna win oh uh, well, I mean, that's what you, the environment in northwest what are you what are you gonna say man they're just like rolling over like little puppies and want you to rub their belly oh, like they dude. know that they're gonna lose dude, so- they cared more about what type of champagne was in their mimosa than who was gonna win the game did you guys chant uh, Northwestern was my safe school at all? Well, so we did. Ch- so at the tailgate, I had some girls and friends with go up to some of them and say like, hey, like, why is everyone wearing purple right now? Like pretending like they didn't know there's a football game. And some of the guys were like, oh, um, I, don't, I don't know. It's parents weekend. Like they didn't know there was a football game. <laughs> and then I, and then me and my buddies were like saying that Northwestern was a D2 football team. And those, some of those guys were getting rattled by that, but we were oh, like, wrong. Hey, yeah, we weren't wrong. And then the, <laughs> one of my other friends was asking where the nearest library was and people were pointing him in the direction. Like it was the Fuck, normal thing Of course thing to they do. fucking knew, man. Yeah. That's so embarrassing. They always know, bro. They always know the nerd, the Northwestern nerds, the NNs. Northwestern nerds. N ends. Remember that, ladies and gentlemen. Double the N ends. Double ends. We got anything else? We wrapping her. Yeah, let's wrap this up. All right, guys. Appreciate you guys listening. Keep your eyes peeled for the rest of this week for some promotions and some other giveaways. I'm not going to say who right now, but it's pretty exciting shit that's going to be going on for the rest of this month. So keep your eyes peeled. Like always, not the same time, same place. We'll see you guys later.